Hello, my name is Ricky Porter, and this television program is called At Home in Dublin with Ricky Porter. This program is all about the betterment of Dublin. It is featuring a cast of characters, movers and shakers, artists, folk who make Dublin a fine and wonderful place to live. I'm extremely pleased to be doing this program with Channel 35. Today, I have as our guest a friend, uh, a colleague, a person that I admire ex in an extraordinary way, Miss Frenchie Hodges. Welcome to At Home in Dublin with Ricky Porter. Thank you. How are you? I'm fine, I'm fine, and I'm happy to be here, be one of your guests. I'm very glad you're here. I'm very glad you're here. Um, before the program began, you and I got a chance to visit, and that was good, because you are such a wealth of a person that trying to come in to interview you from scratch, which I tend to interview people from scratch, would have been almost an impossible task, because your book would be a book of many vol. The life, your life would be a life of books of many volumes. What do you think of that metaphor? I think that's an apt metaphor because you know a man in his life lives many lives you know and it's true I have uh, lived many lives in few places but you know many different aspects mm -hmm. yeah okay why don't we start from the beginning okay I am very fascinated with the Buckeye community and um, since you're my guess, I don't want to focus so much on my experience with Buckeye, but I do want to mention that I knew about the Buckeye community before I ever traveled to the Buckeye community because it was highly acknowledged as a dense populated area of African Americans who, after the Emancipation Proclamation, owned land, received an educated education, uh, maintained their homes and became prominent, prominent families. So politicians traveling through the state of Georgia made sure they stopped in Buckeye. So tell me a little bit about the Buckeye community. What you told me is that geographically it is the north side of the Oconee River, easterly side of it is the Ben Hall Lake, the north side of it is Georgia Highway 57. But tell me a little bit of a Buckeye from, a, from the perspective of a little girl growing up in Buckeye. Well, it's true, I was born in Buckeye, uh, but my grandfather lived in the Mount Pullen community, and uh, my father sharecropped with my grandfather. So as a child, four and five years old and six, I lived in Mount Pullen, and at seven, we acquired our own farm in Buckeye, where my brother lives today. Um, now, and when you say acquired, in Buckeye, your parents were not sharecroppers? They actually owned the land? Yes. Okay. Yes, that, that would have been in 1947. They, oh, God, they bought a they, farm. Right, uh -huh. There was some kind of uh, program that helped uh, black families acquire lands. The, 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 the area was developed with these neat little homes on them. And we acquired one of those neat little homes, and the homes carried about 100 to 150 acres. Wow. And so we had approximately 52 plus or minus acres on our side of the road, on, on the side that the house was on. And on the opposite side of the road, there were maybe 100 acres. And... Um, and your parents owned all of that land? Well, they were buying it. They were buying it. They were it. buying it. Okay. And uh, when I... This was in 1947. In 1958, I left to go to Clark. Well, I wasn't very tuned in to uh, financial dynamics, and my parents borrowed on the land across the road oh. to uh, finance me and Clark for two years. Oh. And I think um, they uh, they sold that land. They never did pay it off. Okay. They they didn't. Some of the families sent their children with that same kind of setup, and the children came back from college and paid the land off. I wasn't programmed 
and I didn't understand. I didn't tune in, and I didn't Correct. understand. So today, your family owns land in Buckeye. Yes. Okay. Yes. So you've been able to retain some of that. Yes. Well, my father. I mean, my brother. Your brother. Yeah, How many brother, brothers? I have one brother. One brother. I had two brothers, but my other brother is deceased. And any sisters? Yes, I have two sisters. You have two sisters. And um, my one sister lives in Jacksonville, but my uh, older sister, who will turn ninety on the fifteenth um, of May, lives right next door to me. And we live across the road from land that we inherited from our grandfather, Lucius Mathis. Is that right? Yes. What a beautiful story. Have you ever yeah. thought of writing um, just the autobiographical facts of your life in Buckeye? Um, no, no, I hadn't. I hadn't. Mm. I had not. I had not discovered. Um, Compelling mm -hmm. um, focus or yeah. motivator right. uh, for telling the story, right. but the more I learn about it, there's a lot about Buckeye that I don't know. Correct. For instance, why is it called Buckeye? And then when I learned about the Buckeye State, I just don't know. It's yeah. a mystery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, a mystery to um, at some point um, discern. Yes. Now. Um, I understand that you're on the board of directors for the Oconee Fall Line Technical College, formerly Heart of Georgia. That's right. Right. And how long have you been on the board of directors? I've been on the board since, well, I've been there six years, so this is what? Six from 14 leaves eight, 2008. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have a particular role on the board of directors? No, no, just a board member. Just a board member. Yes. Uh huh. Who chairs the board of directors? Um, there are different chairs. It oh, rotates. They rotate. Okay. And um, it is rotated. Uh, I can't call the name okay. of the chair right now. Know. Is there anyone else on the board you think I might know? I'm just out of curious. Yes, uh, Ernest Wade is, oh, is uh, one Mr. of the Wade. newer members. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Plummer. Yeah. Oh, Doctor Plummer. Off one Dr. of your Plummer. church call. Yeah. He, he recommended me under uh, Randy, Doctor Randy. Uh, the previous president right? of O'Connor Farm mm -hmm. Line. Yes. Very good. So you're enjoying that experience? Yes. Yes, I'm enjoying it pretty good. Um, I find it very challenging because I, I'm i more interested in liberal arts education, and it deals with the technical aspects. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you, it's still, it, it fulfills a very important uh, uh, need in our community, training people to do hands-on things. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about education then. Mm -hmm. um, I understand you're a graduate of the Oconee High School, yes. which I understand um, was the historic black secondary school in Dublin, Georgia. Yes. Okay. And um, the process and the result of integration um, dissolved the Oconee High School and African Americans integrated with um, the white community into Dublin High School. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. And um, from our earlier conversation, you helped me to understand that during your tenure at Oconee, the principal was Mr. Lucius Bacote. Lucius T. Bacote. Lucius T. Bacote. Do you know what yes. the T stood for? Telefero. <laughs> Let me tell you why this is of particular interest to me. Yes. As you know, I pastor Washington Street Presbyterian Church. Yes. Lucius Bacote and his wife were chartered members of the Washington Street Presbyterian Church. Yes. When Mr. Bacote retired... Mm -hmm. It was through his influence and, and involvement that he recruited the next principal, a cousin from South Carolina, Mr. Charles Manning, who's also a member of Washington Street Presbyterian okay. Church. Okay. So I, I feel like I have some spiritual ties with the Oconee High School yes. because of Mr. Bacot and also because of Mr. Manning. Yes. But I'd, I'd like to hear more about 
the Oconee High School in terms of, well, our time is limited for the interview, so I'm going to ask a very pointed question. Sure. Um, has integration been favorable to the African American youth? In other words, did we as African Americans have a better handle on the management and the direction of our youth and children when we had our own institution that was independent and we were able to be the custodians of our children in our own way? Did integration cause us to loosen our grips and we were not able to superintend the way we would have normally? And I'm making a theoretical conjecture, but I'm not implying anything because I haven't researched to study. But you have retired as a public school educator. You did your high school education in, an, in a renowned um, black high school that is now the Na uh, Coney High School National Alumni Association. What's, what are your thoughts about integration? What, do you th what are your thoughts about education today. Okay, if we have time for me to answer, I'm going to answer. Please. Um, everything that I believe has is an evolution, is part of an evolution over a period of time. Um, I attended Oconee High School, black school. I went to Clark College, black school, Fort Valley State, black school, taught in Quitman, Georgia at Washington Street High School, black school. I went to Detroit, Michigan. I taught at Spain Junior High School, black school. However, Detroit called itself quote unquote integrated. I taught at Northern High School, black school. I came back to the South to Atlanta, Georgia in 1978 when integration was fully on its way. And I taught at George Washington Carver Comprehensive High School, black school. Now, one day I looked around and I have an aunt, the aunt that I'm going to visit today, who, who is 93. Just a few years older than your older sister? Yes. Isn't that amazing? Yes, yeah. it is. So okay. um, But you're going to visit she, her? She, she taught in uh, Crisp County High School, and she was part of the transition from black school to integrated school and listening to her and other people who were involved in integration over the years um, I began to sense that in a sense the black child who was on the borderline or needy that his needs were going to be subdued or overlooked or Whose needs were greater. Whose needs were greater because... Of various socioeconomic reasons. Yes, because the teacher, my aunt included, celebrated teaching the white child who came in with his or her homework neatly done. They could breathe a sigh of relief that, it, that now at last is, is working as it should work. And somehow I feel that the black child began to lose out when integration came, oh. even from black teachers. But I don't, oh. I didn't experience it myself. Now, oh. my story is, I looked around one day and all of my friends had experienced integrated workplace places. Well, my workplace was integrated, but for the most part, all these years, I have led a sheltered professional life in that I have not had to deal with a classroom of black and white children. However, I taught every class as though it were an integrated class. I didn't teach a black class. I mean, I taught an integrated class. I used the words. I, I oh. lectured the things the same as if it had been. Mm -hmm. You understand what I I'm saying? I do understand. Uh, because I didn't want one day there to be an influx of white children and my children look at me and say, why are you changing? 
So I changed with integration in that way. Very good. But I never had, I never, you I never, had, You never I, taught a literal integrated class. That's right. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to sort of delve on this for one more moment, and then we're going to move on, because I do want to get to your new publication. Yes. I interviewed um, earlier um, George Roussel, Dublin City Manager, and I also interviewed earlier Robert Hunter, um, mm -hmm. the present principal at Dublin High School. Yes. And we talked about this subject a little bit. Um, rather than talking about this subject um, from the point of view of it being problematic, yes. what I'd like to talk about now is what can we do as uh, religious people um, what can we do as um, older folk that can try to turn the tide from what we're now seeing in our school system? For example, um, teenage pregnancy, um, it is an acute problem. I mean, there are people now hired for the whole purpose of trying to prevent teen pregnancy. <laughs> um, Another example would be um, that you're at a Coney Fall line, but what about the student who seems to have no potential for education, either vocationally or the liberal arts, and they've already begun to get into delinquent kind of behavior? In other words, do you think that there's some veracity to the concept of the lost generation? Or should we even entertain that notion? Well, I've asked several questions. Take your time. Yeah, you, you have asked a very loaded question. You've posed uh, a very... Now, I chuckle when you mentioned about teenage, the teenage pregnancy problem. When I came to um, teach in Georgia, sex education was a high... Uh, insert in the curriculum. And um, I, I guess there were some great studies going on at Georgia State University. Mm -hmm. And uh, the professor from the school, our school was a test school, a, a, a place where people could come and try their ideas out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they addressed the teenage pregnancy problem. And different um, facets of that study had them talking to parents, had them talking to teachers. We had to give up one preparation period a week to talk, sit and talk with them the about no, parents. with the learned people from Georgia oh, State. Uh, our insights faculty. Uh -huh, uh -huh. into okay. the, the teenage pregnancy. Right, right, right. Well, in, in having that core of uh, discussions, as we talked from week to week about this problem, and it was a it's big problem teenage pregnancy um, I became it helped me to examine my thoughts and awarenesses and what we know for sure and one thing that we know for sure is children are taught you know in South Pacific a child has to be taught to hate a child has to be taught to love a child is taught and it began to occur to me that we would not be able to stem the tide of te the teenage pregnancy problem because the child had already learned lessons that could not be unlearned, unlearned by the education system. Wow. Yeah. And so um, it, 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 what it did for me was it made me consider that in order to stem the tide of the teenage pregnancy problem, we would have to target parents mm -hmm. and and we would all we would need to target teenagers when they became parents to encourage their children wow. to choose another route to be different they had to affirm them differently right. so well we have opened up a can with a lot of worms as one <laughs> yes. would say um, and we don't have the opportunity now to delve into it more but one of these days I would like to do so I would like to introduce um, Ms. Hodges' new book, I call her Frenchie, Peace the Way Home. No, were you wanting to save this page? 
No, no, okay, no, right. no, no, no. Um, Peace de Way Home. Frenchie Jolene Hodges um, is a published poet. Um, she's also the producer, um, director, and co-founder of Legacy Readers Theater. Um, Legacy Readers Theater is a primarily African American theatrical group. Uh, would that be that's the right proper way of saying it? And um, after retirement, she came to Dublin and has contributed to the arts here in Dublin. And I think it's been a wonderful enhancement. I'd like for you to try to talk a little bit about Legacy Readers Theater and try to dovetail that with this book of poetry. And before we close, I definitely want you to read something from this new publication. I would be delighted to. Yes, um, I was not formally trained for the stage, but I was always attracted to the stage. In fact, at Oconee High School, I got my first taste of the stage with uh, high school productions. Um, when I relocated to Detroit, there, there was a big movement on for community theater and uh, a, a historic theater that had been started there was the Concept East Theater, started by Woody King, who later migrated to New York as a great person in theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, I joined the Con Concept East Theater, which was a community theater, and we, I learned, that's where I basically got my training and appreciation for uh, the spoken word in many different forms because we did um, the same God's trombones, we mm -hmm. did it there. We did uh, Hand is on the Gate, the mm -hmm. collection of poetry. However, we memorized all of the pieces, material. Mm -hmm. material. Mm -hmm. So when I came to Dublin, I started collaborating with my 10th grade high school friend Yvonne Lamb would also Yvonne Lamb looking. Castillo Castillo, right mm -hmm. and uh, what we wanted to do was write a definitive drama that depicted what we know, knew for sure and uh, we collaborated for about two or three years and we never produced anything but we enjoyed talking <laughs> <laughs> and um, so after that time I um I started thinking about where I was in Dublin. Uh, we already knew and anticipated the problem we would have getting people to lend time or give time to theatrical development. And I thought about the Reader's Theater. I had done it with my students, high school students, Reader's Theater, because it's hard to get students to learn things too. But if you learn to teach them how to read them, uh, others will sit and listen, you know. So I thought about Reader's Theater, if we could uh, corral a bunch of people who were interested in the spoken word and our native uh, songs, the spirituals, I believed that it would sell, it would be a good thing. And that's how Legacy Reader's Theater came about. Um, we started recruiting people. She recruited people who she knew sang well. I recruited people that I knew had to love the spoken word because they were in the pulpit or they had been teachers. And that's how it got started. Wow. And you have already approached the seventh anniversary of Legacy Readers or you are, you are approaching it? Uh, have you passed uh, the seventh anniversary? This was the seventh. Oh, so yeah. our last... Yeah, our last was, production was the seventh, was the seventh production. Was the seventh anniversary yes. production. Okay, segue then for a moment about... Um, about Peace the Way Home. Peace the Way Home. Start with the title, Peace the Way Home. Well, uh, when, I, when I was a young woman visiting friends in uh, California, we were sitting around reminiscing. They had relocated there. I relocated to Michigan. And we were remembering our roots in Georgia and things we had done. They grew up in Greenville, Georgia. I grew up in Dublin, Georgia. And we were reminiscing, and uh, you remember when you went to the prom? Yeah, and your, your mother was sitting out there waiting for you when it was over, and remember the first time you kissed a boy, and remember, you know, all kinds of little things. And we went further back into childhood, and remember when somebody would come over to see, and then you would go piece the way home with them? Yes, and they would turn around and go piece the way home back with you. And um, this struck a chord in me. 
Peace the Way Home, we had that in common. And um, so I wrote that first, that title poem, Peace the Way Home. Now I want to read that poem. Please. And then I want to tell you about a friend of mine, uh, her, I want to read her statement upon receiving that book. Okay. This is Peace the Way Home. You can only go as far as the bridge, she said, and tied a red rag around her head. I proudly got to my faded sun hat, exploding with the joy of being treated grown at last. Walking down the dusty road, the sun beaming, flies buzzing, I was a dusty child, reveling in the day that was. Aunt stopped to enjoy the momentary coolness of a big tree along the way. Then there was the bridge, sturdy in its decaying woodenness, and the great waters rushing, rushing, rushing past my child eyes. You go straight home now, she said. My day was high, and quick as that, she was gone. I looked back once and caught the rag on her head, disappearing red beyond the hills. It was the first time I had ever met goodbye, and I cried all the way home. Well, that's beautiful. Very, very beautiful. And that's the ant that I'm going to visit today. Is, wow, wow. That's even more beautiful. Now, I have a friend in Washington who, when she received this book, she uh, wrote me this email. She said, meanwhile, what you must know is that peace in the way is an old African custom. While in Ghana, I learned that it was customary for the children to walk you at least part of the way after you visited. Sometimes, depending upon how far you lived, they would go the entire way. I lived on the grounds of a Presbyterian mission that had built both a teacher training college and a hospital. And one of my friends that was married to one of the doctors and he and his family lived right near my place on hospital grounds. It was just a short hop through the trees to the training college. My sister friend Betty always teased me that snakes might be a hanging from the tree branches and that the children should see to my getting home safe. Of course, she had five kids, so I was accompanied by the whole brood <laughs> from the Frimpong household. It was always an adventure. Well, I, I, I mean, tears came to my soul because I realized that here again was some lost trait that we brought from Africa and did not know. Mm. And mm. did not know. Peace in the way. And so now I'm writing a new book called Peace in the Way. <laughs> <laughs> Anything, any, any reason to write, leave it up to a writer. Give me a cause and I shall write. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, this has been a wonderful, wonderful experience for me, interviewing Ms. Frenchie Hodges, a friend and colleague, a citizen of Dublin, Georgia. Thank you very much for joining us at home in Dublin with Ricky Porter. And today I can say with a sense of esteem, at home in Dublin with Ricky Porter, and Frenchie Hodges. Thank you very much for joining us.